here. All right. Oop, what did I do? I don't know. Are I just got a lot better looking when the screen kind of darkened a little bit. So that's what <laughs> okay, let's see if this goes away. Yeah. Okay, so um, could, could we just start by uh, having you go over your kind of career path, how you got to where you okay. are? And uh, um, last time we actually talked, aside from the tests on Friday, you were studying for the exam. Yeah, that was, I guess, that was the 98, 99 uh, school year at, at VR, not VR, at CBA. Yeah, where right? we taught together. He and I taught together up in Colorado. Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, oh, I got pixelated. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. You do look better pixelated. I know. I, I'm not going to argue that point. I, I, I feel like I look more sinister. Uh, <laughs> you look like I a... I do this, like, like you know. Um, You're a Cylon. <laughs> yeah, not the first time I've been called that, but that's just because of the territory, you know. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, I kind of got started uh, as an interest in, in joining the Foreign Service actually the year before, in 97, when I was working in New Mexico at a, at a school, and uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I liked teaching, but I didn't know if that was what I wanted to do forever. Um, and so I, uh, it's a fairly long process. I mean, the whole process all whole took about two, two and a half years to get through. And there's multiple stages to it. The first stage was the written exam. And then afterwards was the oral exam. And after I met you, that's where I, uh, that's where I was preparing for the oral exam. And I actually took the oral exam February of 99. Um, so, you know, towards the end of the school year at CBA. Um, we flew up to San Francisco and took the oral exam there, and then I found out that day that I passed. And then there's, after that, there's still another process where I had to go through a background check, security clearance, and all that. And that took quite a while. I sent people all around um, to interview, you know, asking if I was a you know, trustworthy guy and all that. And I found enough suckers to say yes that they went ahead and gave me, you know, security clearance. So, and then I got, I actually started work with the State Department with Foreign Service in March of 2000. And I've been with them ever since. Um, I did my first overseas assignment away that summer in 2000. I flew to the Caribbean in Barbados, and I worked with the American Embassy there. I came back after that, and I did a uh, nine months worth of language training, um, and I learned Greek, and then I spent two years at the American Embassy in Athens, right during the Olympics, which is pretty cool. cool. And then I came back and walked, worked in Washington for four years in two different offices, uh, one in the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Island Affairs, one job in the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs, where I handled Nepal issues, Bhutan, India, Sri Lanka, that was really cool. The other previous job was in Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Islands, which was really neat as well. And then since uh, summer of 2009, I've been the Consular Section Chief in Doha and Qatar. Uh, that's where I am now, I'll be here for another year, so I'll start to think about where I'm going next this summer. But that's kind of a quick resume, I guess, um, well, of what I've been doing since the last time you and I were in the same place. Cool. There's a um, what? What is it that you actually do in Doha? I can tell you, but I have to kill you. <laughs> um, we have smart bombs that are coming your way, so just enjoy the story. <laughs> okay. Um, no, but let me let me let me kind of break down the different kind of things that that NMC does and different type of things that we do in the Foreign Service. There's basically several different career tracks, and they're not necessarily strict. You can move from one to the other. I spent my whole career moving around from career track to career track. Um, but they are, they're kind of what you kind of tend to fall into from time to time. But there's, uh, what I'm doing now is consular work. Consular work is basically, if an American citizen overseas or a foreigner overseas is familiar with an American embassy, to any extent, it's consular work. Because what we do is we provide, we interview people for visas to go to the United States for work, or study, or live, or visit. We do a green card, uh, we call it an immigrant visa, but it's, it's basically a green card. We do interviews for that. And then we also do American citizen services, and that can be anything from passport applications. We're usually the only notarial service abroad that's acceptable in the continental United States. So if you have a power of attorney, you need notarized, and you live overseas, you come to the American Embassy and do it. Um, we do passports, we do reports of birth abroad when a baby is born overseas. Um, and the American, you know, they acquire American citizens from their parents, we'll, we'll verify that, and then issue the birth the class of reports of birth, also the birth certificate. Long form. Um, and then uh, we also do things like, you know, emergency services for people who 
lost their ability to travel, or for people who've been victims of crime, for people who find themselves in trouble with the law, stuff like that. So a wide variety. That's what I'm doing now. Uh, when I was in my first kind of political officer, political officer basically reports on politics in the host country back to uh, the Washington, the federal government back in Washington, basically the state department. Um, and then, uh, hold on a second, I got some weird message. Apparently, I've won a, a million dollars. <laughs> yeah, who knew? Um, and so, uh, and so they report back and they pull on policy developments. They also can be called to deliver critical requests from, from the United States government to a foreign government. We call that a march and walk in and meet with the counterpart of the foreign government and you say, hey, we would like you to vote with us on this, on issue X in the UN or something like that. Um, we also have economics officers that do the same kind of deal uh, with respect to the economic situation in the country. Um, we have management officers. Uh, management is basically, you know, you have to see how a lot of people work in the embassy. You need to manage those people. You need to direct the HR. Uh, and then also general services. So, like, you know, they make sure that the plumbing works. They make sure that the lawn is remote. They make sure that the plan is up to date, which is a ton of work, actually, because these things are not cheap. Um, and then we have public diplomacy as well, and that's basically press and public affairs, it's also exchanges, it's also any kind of concern, you know, dealing with our image or, or something like that. So that's basically how it breaks down, and those career fields, you can move back and forth from one to the other. Uh, but that's the kind of work that we do, generally speaking. Um, and also, you do it when you go back to Washington, D.C. as well. So it's, uh, it, 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 the cool thing is that you can always change around after a few years when you move from job to job. and it, I really like that. You know, I get tired of jobs pretty quickly, so right when I'm getting used to my job, I'm about to get tired of it, I have to change it. So that's really nice. You know, I, I like that. I'm not a very consistent person when it comes to the public. Well, a quick follow up to that, and then we'll have some students ask, ask some questions. Sure. What kind of, what kind of decisions are you making throughout the day? Are you when you're interviewing? Are you you're, you're assessing the trustworthiness of people who show up? Or yeah, that's a, that's actually a really good question. Um, we have a whole set of laws. Uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act governs what we do. It's very legal oriented. It, it, mm -hmm. It's ridiculous job that I'm in now. Um, excuse me, I'm sitting on my laptop because I switched my legs over. It's kind of rock. I'm not actually in a ship. That's about the capital or something like that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we're governed by the Immigration and Nationality Act. And we're, the main thing we're looking for is. Um, the law says that any applicant who comes for a tourist visa or a business visa like that is assumed to be an immigrant. That means they're not qualified because we're talking about a non-immigrant visa. So they're assumed to be disqualified until they can prove otherwise. So what we're looking for is, is we're constantly judging against the standards. This person is attending immigrant. Um, you know, and, and it's not such a big deal here where I live, but imagine if you're in Mexico, right? And you've got millions of Mexicans trying to cross the border in the United States. And these guys are coming for interviews. You've got a, a pretty high refusal rate because of a huge chunk of them don't have any kind of ties there to compel them to come back to Mexico. Right. Instead, you figure there's a really good, and the law says you have to figure there's a really good chance you may end up working illegally in the United States somewhere. So it's, in many ways, it's the first line of defense um, that we have. Now, obviously, there are not a lot of Mexicans coming through my waiting room here in the Middle East, but we do have a few, but they're generally very good because they work for a oil company or something like that. Right. The other thing we look for as well, we look for fraud. There's a lot of fraud. Um, you're always looking for, for you know, shady documents, stuff like that. We find them all the time. And it, it just so happens that I mean, there's other, other, there's a whole slew of, of exclusions, you know, of things that disqualify for someone from coming to the United States. And just the other day, I was talking to someone, and I ran the numbers, and in the last handful of years, we had over, over a dozen, close to 20 people that we refused on terrorism related grounds as well. So we, we see that a lot in, here in the region. Um, you know, and so it's not just like some, you know, you can rationalize if you, if you let some Albanian go to the United States and he ends up working in a, in a you know, Pizza restaurant as a dishwasher, you can kind of rationalize that in your mind. But if you make a mistake and it ends up leading to another terrorist attack, that's you can't rationalize that. And right. you know, for example, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the master of my mind and all that, actually lived in Doha, lived in Qatar for a while. Really? Um, we had people associated with 9 11 come through. We had, I don't know if you remember, uh, during the, the second Gulf War, uh, the administration produced this deck of cards. So some yep. of the cases and all that. Yep. We had a guy from the deck coming here. No was, kidding. You know, yeah, so, so what did you do to him? Uh, we told him to go away. Uh, <laughs> you didn't have... And, that, um, and, and we basically, I mean, he's not going to say it anytime soon. We'll just do that. But there's a problem. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of different 
legal category that people can fall into. And so you have to be kind of like an administrative judge almost. And, and you know, it's not fun sometimes when you're telling someone they can't go visit their dying sister. But, you know, then again, you also have to think you, you enforce the law here. And it's nothing against them or you, but that's, that's just how it goes sometimes. Right. Okay, well, first question is going to come from Molly. Molly. Let's hear it, Molly. So come on up to the, this chair. <laughs> Yeah, just uh, yeah. Your question's up there on that okay. screen. Okay. So my question is, how does the U.S. benefit from the 1.3 billion dollar annual aid sent to Pakistan? That's a good question. Let's distinguish. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just asking him. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So let's distinguish. There's different types of aid here. It's really important that we make this distinction. Okay, and it's important that we also remember that. The goal of our foreign policy, which includes our development policy and our military policy and our diplomatic policy, is to advance the American interest. So let's let's walk back from that next. Let's talk about the types of aid we're talking about giving here. There's not just one kind of aid. We give assistance, for example, to to rural areas for various kinds of development. It could be building a well in a forbidden area. It could be training mothers on how far apart to have kids so the country doesn't overpopulate. It could be just basic medical services so children don't die of dysentery which is very common in the developing world. That kind of assistance, I think, is pretty non-controversial and stuff that, that is easy to justify. I mean, we're, we're basic human needs. And if we cut that kind of assistance off, you're talking about not harming. It's not an effective use of sanction, I don't think, because you have, you're have you harming the people that you're trying to help that are the most vulnerable. We also have bilateral assistance, and we're talking here about government, government support. We're talking about budget support. We're talking here in a situation about military-to-military uh, -military exchanges and stuff like that. And I think that's probably a bit more controversial in light of what happened um, with the, you know, Pakistan and UBL. UBL, by the way, is what we call Osama bin Laden. So if you ever say UBL, that first is on Osama or Osama bin Laden, what we call UBL. And the issue with that is it's just as much we're trying to advocate our interests. The question you have is if we take that kind of budget support or take that kind of financial assistance away, what is the situation going to be like? Is it going to be better or is it going to be worse? The analysis that we've made in the administration is that it could be worse. And here's the other thing. Um, after uh, Pakistan tested nukes in the 90s, we basically cut off all ties, all assistance, everything. And it took us years to, to eventually find our way, actually took September 11th for us to find our way to getting it back. Now the problem with that is that we lost access to a whole cadre, a whole level of mid-level and senior level. Oh, you guys still there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we lost, we lost access to a whole level, a whole swath of Pakistani military, Pakistani civil service, Pakistani diplomatic service, decision makers in the Pakistani government. So we had absolutely no leverage, no influence over them whatsoever. And that's a real problem too. If we have, if we define that we have an interest in that country, we need to be able to have communication and develop relations with these people to be able to advance our own interests. So while it is controversial, and let's be honest, that, you know, as President Obama just was on the on, 2020 or 60 minutes the other night, so yeah, that was kind of a problem that this guy was living in, in his big old house, you know, 30 miles from Islamabad, right? You know, next to a military academy, that is a problem. But the fact of the matter is, we have long term interests in this country that are in our own interests. And that's how we justify it. Again. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, 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 okay, Mateo. Question is highlighted in blue here. Gotcha. Um, as a whole, how do you feel about the Americans' domineering presence in the Middle East? Do you feel that the Middle Eastern citizens need the U.S. support, or the U.S. is just causing more tension and problems? Another very good question. I wish I was as smart as you guys were when I was in tenth grade. Um, let me let's, let me start with this premise. First of all, when I'm talking to you, I'm still representing the U.S. government. So when you ask a question, I'm going to give the party line. I'm going to give the government answer. So my own opinion is not going to factor into this. If I want to give my opinion, I'll tell you this is my opinion. But let me let me just point that out. Um, so, you know, first of all, domineering is not. I don't think it's a very active word for me to describe. Um, and, and and going back again to to Molly's question about South Pakistan. You know, I mentioned that with Pakistan we lost a whole generation of contacts basically that we could use to support to come in that situation. Here we have we do have military presence. We have military presence in Qatar. We have about 15,000, 18,000 American servicemen at the Al Udaid Air Force Base and also at the Camp Basilia. We have a similar base in Kuwait. We have similar presence in, um, in a smaller presence in the United Arab Emirates. 
Uh, we don't have any military presence in Saudi Arabia anymore. Um, and of course, going back to Egypt, we had a we had a we have a long-standing relationship with Egypt as well, military and military, also a lot of resistance. And that has really actually benefited both the citizens of Egypt. You might recall these mass demonstrations at the Tahrir Square movement in Egypt a, a few months ago. And I would argue, and I think it's it's fairly fairly evident that the fact that we have a relationship and have this long-standing relationship with the Egyptian military allowed us to play a very positive role in making sure that any kind of demonstrations weren't suppressed like it might have been Tiananmen Square, you know, back before you were born probably. Um, so it's not just I don't think domineering is actually a very good way of putting it. Um, the other thing you have to think is when when you when you look at these bases, I mean, we were invited to be here. The bases, we didn't just sit there and say, hey, you guys, we're going to make you establish a base here. Not at least in, in the Gulf region. Iraq, obviously, is a little bit different. But we were invited to establish bases in Bahrain. We were invited to establish bases in, in, in Doha and invited to establish bases in, in the UAE. Uh, with Egypt, Egypt, our military presence goes back to the Camp David Accords in 19. What was it, Kevin? 1978, 79, 79? Yeah, um, that's, that sounds right. Uh, yeah, so. You know, then that, that was again part of the treaty that they made and part of the treaty we made with them. Iraq is a little bit different, uh, but then again, we've also withdrawn three quarters of our troops, two thirds of our troops from Iraq in the last year. To say it's domineering is a bit of a stretch, but it's also, again, in part a function of our being invited there, although again, Iraq's a little bit different, obviously, and a function of, of you know, how can, you know, we have some interest in this region uh, with that. I mean, Iran is just. 70 miles from Iran, and that's one of the reasons why the Qataris are a small country and don't have a big military wanting to be here, because they, they, you know, they're trying to make or they have and they can't secure their own borders per se, or they can because it's a small country, but they they, have, they can't take land in part of invasion or whatever. So they have asked us to kind of camp out here, and, and we get to use that for other purposes as well. But Terry, are you satisfied with that answer? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Alicia. Good question. Uh, good question. Sit down that chair. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's this right here. Oh, I don't wear my contacts. Oh, what was your biggest struggle? Okay. What was your biggest struggle um, with becoming a diplomat? Um, you know, well, is it like an echo here? Hold on. Right. Sorry. Uh, you know, struggle, I don't know, you know, I remember when I was 27, 27 years old, kind of getting plucked out of the U.S., this life I kind of known, and plonked into another country where I didn't know anybody, foreign culture, foreign, you know, language was the same, but the culture was foreign, different everything, um, you know, that was, that took some getting used to at first. Uh, that's probably, the big, the big thing is with this job is, it's, it's fun intellectually, it's a very intellectual job, and it's very challenging and rewarding in that regard. And the upside is that, like, as someone for me who, who doesn't like constancy, doesn't like to, to, you know, be always doing the same thing, I'm always going to change jobs. And that's also the downside, though. It's like once you feel confident in a job, once you feel good at it, bam, it's time to rotate. You know, once you finally get settled down and put roots down and make friends, bam, it's time to move, leave behind and make new friends. And so it's kind of two sides of the same coin. It's, it's on the one hand, I like that because I like meeting people. I'm very extroverted, and I like I'm just hardwired to, to be very restless. But when it comes time to move, that's very tricky. And and the learning a new job thing. The more you do it, the easier it gets. But it's also nice. Um, but for me, and I, I'm a, a very much unabashed in terms of promoting the foreign service. I mean, it, I love it. I wouldn't do anything different. I, it's been a wonderful career, and I don't regret anything about it. It's, had, it's been difficult, and there are times it's difficult, but this is news for you kids, that's life, right? And if it tells you otherwise, it's telling you something, right? Life is hard, okay? Right, Kevin? Yes. There you go. But, but it, it, it's, you know, it's, uh, all that was standing, you know, the struggles, the, let's say the negatives are far, far outweighed by the problem. Thank is, you. Is there a gris? Someone posted a question, and their name was... They put their username as Gris. Is that anyone here? Gris. Gris. Who is that? Cody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
do you think the Pakistani government uh, knew of Osama's whereabouts and chose not to tell the U.S., or do you think their actions were genuine? I have no idea. Honest answer. I have no idea. <laughs> um, and, and honestly, I don't think anyone in the administration knows at this point. Um, take it for what you will that the administration said that we haven't told any, but we didn't tell anyone before until after the raid was over. Read it or what that what you will, but I have no no idea to be honest with you. What what did they do and what they did? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, you want to ask a follow up? Um, has or having uh, moved to Qatar has. Um, any other religions like influenced you, or have you just been like, American, like based? <laughs> uh, How's your faith, Alex? Yeah. <laughs> Turn on the separation of church and state here. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, that's a good question, actually. and actually the answer is yes. Not that I'm converting to any particular religion or anything like that, but in an embassy you have a certain amount of Americans. But the Americans are always outnumbered by the locally hired staff. Okay, we have a whole bunch of locally employed staff that uh, do a lot of the kind of day to day work. Because just for me to come over to the United States, or from the United States, to, to occupy a position in the embassy costs the U.S. government somewhere between three hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, because not just my salary, my benefits, but they also have to put me in a house. Uh, they have to secure the house. Um, I live in a pretty tight security environment, actually. Um, so it's actually quite expensive. So you can imagine we have maybe 300 staff, 350 staff working at the embassy. If you can multiply 350 by 300,000, that's a ton of money. Every single one of them are American. It's just not cost effective. So we can hire locals at the local economy rate for a lot less, and we don't have the same kind of, like they have to, have to find their own housing and stuff like that. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this is because here in Qatar, uh, we have a, a whole bunch of different nationalities represented in the embassy. Uh, that work at locally hired, even though they're they're not from Qatar originally. For example, working for me, I have um, I have one Yemeni, one Moroccan, one Syrian, one Jordanian, one Pakistani, one Ethiopian, one Sudanese, and one American who's married to a, a, a Lebanese who lives here. So you know that's eight different people, eight different countries, right? These are all local hires. So just think about how diverse a group that is. I mean, you know, we're talking about primarily Arabs and Muslims, but then the Sudanese or a Moroccan who comes from the west of North Africa versus the Pakistani who comes from South Central Asia are completely different culturally and completely different, even though they're, you know, they have the same religion. So from that, I've actually learned a lot. And 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 also the fact that these eight, seven of the eight are, are Muslims. Apparently devout Muslims who pray five times a day, who fast during Ramadan, all these things. And I've had a great number of discussions about religion, about, um, you know, the fact of the matter is that in America, you know, you might know a Muslim or two, most people probably do, but you don't work around eight of them when there's 12 of you in office. So they're not three quarters of the people you work with, or the majority of the people that you see in the street every day. So we're not as exposed to it as we might be. Um, and so I learned a lot about Islam, about, let's say, comparative religions. You know, we have a lot of interesting discussions comparing, you know, different faiths and all that. And that's actually had a very profound positive influence on me. You know, you, you worry, you, you learn so much about a culture and a religion like that, it, it's, it can only help. It can only help broaden your knowledge. And, and for that reason, I think it's great to, you know, for more people to come out and, and see this part of the world and study here or get a track through here or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I have to answer that question. Okay. Hey. All right, let me, let me jump in since you're kind of on the topic of uh, this, talking about Islam and uh, living in an Islamic state or Islamic country. Um, what's the treatment of women in, in Qatar, and how do you reconcile that if it's different than what we have here in the States? We only have, what, like another 30 minutes, 45 minutes? Yeah. That, I don't even have enough time to begin this crisis of service. <laughs> Let me try, but it's, it's a very interesting and complex question. Right. Um, we have, I mean, first of all, Qatar is not Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, women can't drive, and women have to cover their hair regardless of their faith. Right. In Qatar, and in Kuwait, and in UAE, kind of other Gulf countries, uh, there's still a very conservative religious element, but they're not, um, they're not uh, as strict with with non-Muslims. Um, you know, the it's interesting. The the quickest way to say to, to 
answer the question, and the one that you hear a lot kind of in our neck of the being in the US or whatever, is that this this culture has established um, oppressive women. And I think that might be true to some extent, but it's it's not a very fair way to answer the question because it, it, the question is so complex. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's absolutely true. You see, you see polygamy here. I think about ten percent of the countries have more than one wife at the same time. Uh, and you see women who are male. You see women who wear black abayas or burkas that you can't see anything of them at all. You see women who you can see the face is just like this. The niqab. And then you see women who wear a hijab, which is just a yeah. face garment. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there's no actual consensus on that in the Islamic world. Uh, the Prophet said that that um, women should wear should dress modestly around people who they might conceivably marry. So outside of their immediate family, they should dress modestly. But there's no more consensus on what modest means. You also have you know people uh, who you know are more stylish than I could ever be. You know, or or you know, and are wearing trendy clothes and have their hair uncovered and, and you know their wrists showing and their elbows showing and all. So there's, there's a very big diversity of, of interpretation of, of what exactly that, that means. Um, and as far as, as, as uh, in general, how they, let's say, treat women socially, you know, yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would suggest that there is probably an argument made that, at least the way we judge it, you know, I mean, let's, you know, women are half the population, roughly, but of the people who make decisions in the country, they're probably 2%. So all the people in the business are here. But you have to look at that, and that culturally and socially, women often still desire to to be very family oriented. They tend to marry very young here, you know, in their early twenties. They have children right away. They have large families, and that's a that's a very esteemed and respected role in society. It's just not a very public role. Um, is that oppressive to women? You know, like, like I said, I can't even begin to, to answer that question. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you go to the mall. Everyone here has. has we call them the best employees, they're maids, right? Everyone here. I've got a, I, I have a living maid, believe it or not, okay? Um, <laughs> it is awesome. I'm not gonna, you know, we are very fair, we treat her very equitably, we pay her three times the minimum rate, you know, we pay her health care, we provide roof and all this stuff. You know, and we know, I know for a fact that we are in the top 2% of, of employers when it comes to income for, for maids. Mm -hmm. But you go to the shopping malls, you go to the stores, and you see these women who are completely veiled in black, and you see the way they treat their female maids, and you realize who was being oppressed and who was oh, the really? oppressor and the oppressor. And it's, the relationship is a little bit more complicated. So I hope that begins to answer the question. It does. I know. You know, I, I spent a week in Bahrain and UAE, and, and I, I came back with a much more complicated opinion on that matter. I went there with a pretty simplistic opinion. Right. And right. Uh, just being there really... Like like you said, it's I, I my I, I can't express my opinion as well as I used to be able to. And, and there's no doubt there are things that I think that we're concerned about when it comes to that. Um, mm -hmm. And Thunder's actually fairly progressive. The the middle of the the Emir is the ruler has three wives, and the middle one is uh, Sheikh Almosa is her name, and she is very public, very glamorous, and is also behind a whole lot of really positive initiatives as far as education for women and all this stuff. And that's had some of that. Um, you know, and uh, um, there's something else I was going to say about about that. Anyway, if well, I know, is I'll... is your opinion of the Saudi Arabian culture more sim simpler? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert on it, but I think it's probably a bit more chauvinistic. I mean, yeah. it's the fact that women can't drive, right? And they have every woman has to be veiled or has to be a head start, You know, um, yeah. So I, I would say so. And there's some elements like that here, but they've been fairly well marginalized, so you don't have that. I mean, you have to be very careful. For example, you can't eat pork. There's no pork here. Uh -huh. So no bacon is like turkey bacon. Um, yeah, or beef bacon. And it's not as good. That sounds it's horrible. <laughs> when I went to Germany for a concert not that long ago, I was like, double helping of bacon for me. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's, it's, you can get alcohol here, but it's not easy to do, and heaven help you if you have a beer in public, or if you are caught drunk driving or anything like that, that's real serious. Yeah. So there's things like that here that you have to be aware of as well. Oh, here's what I was going to say. I also, we also know that that part of where the kind of, if there is oppression occurs in this need to protect women, um, you know, like that we don't trust anyone around our women, so we have to protect them. But as a positive side too, I've got a, a mentally ill prisoner, female prisoner in jail here, and in other 
countries would be very worried that she'd be, be you know, ripe for sexual exploitation in jail because she's mentally ill. She's not getting the treatment she needs. We're trying to get her the treatment she needs, but that's very hard to do. Um, you know, but but someone like that is very easy to exploit potentially. Uh, and we're very happy here because we know that because of this profound sense of, of protecting the honor of women, that she will be completely safe in, in jail, and we're not worried about. It. So that's, you know, is this an American woman? Yeah, it's an American woman. Really? Yeah. Wow. All right, well, let's move on with uh, another question from Max. Talk to you, Max. Oh, yeah, Molly wants to ask you a quick follow-up question, then Max. All right. Just really quickly, do you, so you work with some American women, right? Yes, um, I do. What, what standards are they expected to conform to in terms of, like, cultural? You know, it's, it's okay here. Uh, like I said, the big thing is you wouldn't want to be, like, if, if you were, uh, if you were, Eating this big massive ham sandwich with like a bottle of wine in your hand, you could get in serious trouble here. In fact, if you were to either of those two things in public, you get in serious trouble. Um, but uh, you know, other than that, you wouldn't want to be walking around like in a tank top downtown. Uh, you know, you want to dress fairly modestly. You know, you don't want to you know halter top something like that. You want to make sure that your you know your shoulders are covered probably. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, you know, I mean, something like that. It's really just, the idea is that you're in a foreign culture and you have to respect that there are some people who accept that there are visitors here and, and, and the, there's a lot of foreigners here, but they build all the buildings and they're very, you know, they, they need them. And so they want to accept their presence here, but they do respect that you show a certain amount of understanding of their own culture. They're not going to ask everyone to be bailed or wearing a job, but they would at least respect that, you you know, the culture, the culture here is that, and historically in this part of the world, is that women dress very modestly. And so you, it, it pays for respect. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. All right, next. Okay. Thanks. Um, living in the Middle East, are, is there anything that you really miss from America with regularity, like food or something like that? Bacon. Bacon, yeah. bacon of course. I'd miss bacon. Um, you know, uh, it's, you know, this is pretty advanced, uh, like, uh, infrastructure here. So, like, I mean, we're Skyping, right? So I've got a broadband internet access, so I can get access to all my, my, you know, I can watch sports TV and watch, you know, on my computer or whatever. I can, I can keep up with what's going on in the U.S. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, I'd love to go to a group hub and have a big, you know, I can realize we're all underage, but, you know, when you turn 21, you might want to consider, you know, you know, responsibly drinking alcohol. And, uh, you know, like, I, uh, you know, the adults enjoy safety and, and, and responsibly, of course. Um, you know, and, yeah, like, I'm not lying, man. I would love, I would love, you know, I, would, I like barbecue a lot. I would love to get a big pork loin or a slab of pork bread to go on. <laughs> and it's more future comforts like that. Um, anything else? Uh, you know, in general, you know, like I said, all my best friends basically live in the U.S. and I don't get to see them very much. You know, you're not very near your parents. You know, my parents are getting older. My mom is now a cancer survivor. She's doing well, but there was a cancer scare for a while. And, you know, things like that. You do as you grow up, you, you know, you, you do feel this like, you know, most people, they go live near where their parents grew up or at least a short flight away, you know, or on the other side of the U.S. in like two hours. I, you know, and I'm 14 hours, 15 hours from the East Coast. Uh, so, yeah, things like that. Um, yeah. Good All question, right. Matt. All right. Anything, is that really cool? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Back up. Um, what are the views you hold on Gaddafi and the way he has chosen to handle the rebellious attacks in Libya? Right, so like I guess I personally don't really want to factor into this. But I can tell you that our position in the administration that Gaddafi, you know, I mean, the UN Security Council passed a resolution saying that he needs to go, he needs to leave power, he hasn't chosen to do so. And, and we continue to, to find ways to sure that that happens. Um, you know, that's a kind of quick and dirty answer. What was the second part of that question, please? Um, I mean, like the way he ch uh, chooses to handle the rebellious attacks in Libya. Yeah, obviously, you know, we don't enter into conflict lightly, as much as that might sound surprising. Particularly not in a situation where we've already engaged in two wars in the Middle East. And so, you know, it's a pretty serious affair. And the international will of the international community, including the Arab world, by the way, Qatar is actually participating militarily in this in these in, in our actions in Libya. Qatar actually has sent uh, airplanes and also provided training, so they actually have a presence, a military presence that's being you know. So it's not just 
the Americans, it's not just Europe, whatever. This is a pretty broad spectrum of international opinion that has weighed in and said that Gaddafi is well past his prime and needs to go. And as long as he refuses to do that and, refuse, and, and continues to insist on fighting, you know, and preventing the establishment of transitional national council to start to begin to work on a new government that is truly representative of the hopes and dreams of the Libyan people, he's, he has to go. And until he realizes that, we're unfortunately still going to be stuck in the situation. Alex, has the uh, Arab Spring hit Qatar at all? Is there, are there no, citizens uh, that are? Not as such. I mean, if you define the Arab Spring as this kind of mass movement of people who heretofore had not had a voice in government uh, and to say, no, not here. And I'll tell you why. That's because everyone here is fantastically rich. Um, uh -huh. You know, if, if you look at Bahrain, which is kind of the closest, it's, we're somewhere between Bahrain and, and, and the UAE. In Bahrain, they had a pretty large Shia population that was fairly disaffected. And, and there we're trying, one of our goals is to make sure that they have a voice at the seat of the table and their, their concerns can be heard. Here we have a very small Shia population, and they're absolutely stinking, filthy rich. <laughs> like, the house that I'm living in is built by a guy, this guy's name is Al Ferdan, and he owns property everywhere, and he's probably worth a billion dollars or something like that. Um, and, and the other thing is that Qatar, the average, the per capita, if you take, now, this is an interesting fact about Qatar. Qatar is about 2 million people living here. There are about 200,000 of them are actual Qatari. Everyone else, so 90, somewhere around 90% of the country is actually third country nationals. Primarily here in in construction, building buildings, building work on oil fields, uh, and stuff like that. If you take the whole population and you factor in there and you figure out the per capita GDP, that per capita GDP, so their average population, average income per head per year, is around sixty thousand U.S. dollars a year. That's for that's for that's citizens good. or for all for people everyone. for everyone. All right. Now, if you take out the hundred the, the, the million poor Nepalis that earn two hundred dollars a month, and the two hundred fifty thousand Indians that earn the same, and all the poor maids that earn a little bit more than that, and just factor in only the Qataris, that number jumps up to over a hundred thousand dollars per person per year. If wow. You that's U.S. So dollars, and that. There's a is dollar's pretty strong over there. We're actually paying the dollar here, which is oh, super you are. nice. Okay. So yeah. But it goes, uh, but a dollar goes farther there than it does here. Actually, probably not quite. Things are a bit more expensive because they don't produce anything. They very okay. little food for you. It's all imports. However, this is awesome. You're going to hate this. I drive an SUV with a 22 and a half gallon tank. You want to guess how much it costs me to fill it up? Oh my gosh. Ten dollars. Almost. Fifteen bucks. Fifteen bucks, that's insane. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I just filled up and it cost me, uh, I think it was fifty five dollars. You drive a Prius? Is that what it costs? <laughs> you drive a Prius? You're kind of guy who drive a Prius. I am not a Prius driver, but my wife is. Yeah, yeah. All who right, who do we got next? Kobe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're after Kobe then. Come on down here. And you know, if, you, if any of you have questions, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll get you in. Hello. Fifteen dollars uh, to fill up this car. Yeah. Yeah. Right, listen, check this out. Hold on, hold on, hold on. When I lived in Washington, D.C., I rode my bike to work, and we had one car that we filled up once a month. Now we have two big SUVs, and our monthly gas bill is the same. <laughs> right now. Okay, come get me, man. Um, what in influenced you to become a diplomat? Um, was it a childhood dream or a goal that you set for yourself as you grew up? Uh, did any particular person you know or a person in history influence you or spark your decision to become a diplomat? A good question. Oh, great question. Uh, I really like these questions. They're pretty good questions. Um, actually, kind of the answer is kind of all of the above, really. Uh, let, me, let me give you a little more of my background. Maybe this can help explain it. Uh, I was born in Houston, Texas. My parents, my father was born in Indonesia. His dad was a German doctor who moved to Indonesia to work for the Dutch East India Company right before World War II to escape Nazis. My mother was born in the Netherlands, in Holland. Uh, she just grew up there kind of like her whole life. When my dad was 12, he moved to Holland because the Dutch got kicked out of Indonesia. Even though he was a German citizen, he got Dutch citizenship, moved to Holland, and spent the rest of his youth in Holland. They got married, they moved to the U.S., they ended up in Texas. In Texas. Um, 
So I grew up in a kind of internationally minded house already, in a household, and we spent our summers back in college. I, I grew up bilingual. Uh, I, I speak Dutch almost as well as I speak English. Um, when we were, when I was 11, my, my father was a professor at Rice University. Um, when I was 11, we moved to Paris for a, about a year. My dad did a sabbatical at the University of Paris there, and so as an 11 year old, we even having, even though being fairly, you know, having been to Europe for a period of time, haven't really lived there too much, but going from Houston to Paris. Now Houston is a wonderful city, and I will, I will, I will gladly recommend it to anyone. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. It's a nice place, Kevin. I lived there for a year. I'm sorry? I, I lived in Houston. I lived in Katy, Texas for you a year. You lived in Houston. You lived in Katy. That'd be like saying, I lived in San Francisco. You know, I lived in uh, San Mateo or whatever. <laughs> I, lived in, I lived in LA. I lived in Riverside. <laughs> All right. Um, but anyway, so, anyway, so but Houston is also no Paris. Let's be honest. I went from living in this big, sprawling, hot Texas city to... Having to, you know, go to the Eiffel Tower, uh, and go by the Arc de Triomphe on my way to school every morning. I mean, it's just, this kind of opened my mind. That was the first time I thought, hey, you know, this international kind of barrier or whatever. But I was 11, so obviously not that sophisticated thinking about it. But it was an idea. And then uh, when I was uh, a junior, maybe so a sophomore in high school, sophomore or junior, I did a spring break trip to Washington, D.C. And once again, Washington is a very cosmopolitan, worldly city and also very international, and it really kind of inspired me. And so I thought about it for a while, I thought this is really cool, the foreign service idea is really good. And so I kind of, again, I was in high school at the time, and then proceeded to become a horrible student for pretty much all of college, which I thought kind of doomed me to, you know, I thought they always took really smart people who went to really good schools and who got really good grades. And then I found out that's not the case. I said, really, oh, maybe I should try it. And, and really, what, and, and that's kind of what got me started. I was at a point in my life where I, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't know if I wanted to keep on teaching. As much as I enjoyed teaching, it was kind of, the way I was doing it at the time was kind of a transient lifestyle. And Kevin can tell you about my days at Preston Duke. They weren't exactly uh, palatial. You know, I was a dorm parent and a teacher, so I lived in this little, you know, basically the same room that the kids did, which was all good well at the time in my life. I don't regret one minute of it, but. I wanted something a little more permanent, permanency, a little more adventure, and it just it, it kind of came to me, and I just thought to myself, hey, let's try this. You know, it's tough, but hey, the worst thing that can happen is they say no, and, and I just kind of kept on moving, and, and you know, I convinced them I was a condom in the thinking basically that I was qualified to join the point service, and there you go. As far as people that influenced me, um, I don't know. Uh, hard to say. Uh, probably, but... I don't know, it's not something you're very often exposed to, like I wasn't, you know, the kind of international affairs, except in class a little bit, but not the actual conduct of diplomacy and meeting diplomats and all that. But uh, I do remember before I joined, I went to go see a speech that was given by Kofi Annan, who was the former Secretary General of the UN at Rice University. Um, and, and that was really interesting. I really found that inspiring. Also, my, my mother's also a professor, and she was very interested in, in foreign affairs, and so she would take me to these. I saw a speech given by Edward Shevard Nadze, the former president of the Republic of Georgia, not the state of Georgia, even though that seems like it's some foreign country, it's not. Um, and then, uh, you know, things like that. So that, just being kind of surrounded by that, I found very inspiring as well. So, you know, and then I, like I said, I kind of lucked into this. And one day I'm waiting for them to figure me out and realize it was a horrible mistake, but until then, I'm going to keep going. Cool. Bryce? Did that answer the question? Yes, yeah? that's great. Um, so I'm just curious if, like, you can, like, living in Qatar, can you, like, still vote and do other things, like, you know, like that from Qatar? You mean as an American, like American elections? Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. In fact, one of the jobs that I have during election season is to manage the overseas voting process. And so there's a lot of absentee ballots that people bring to the embassy and we put it in the mail and send off. So, yeah, you can vote... Generally speaking, if you have an address that you left in the United States, you can vote for, like I said, I, I have an address now in Virginia. I can own a house in Virginia, and I have resident, residents there, so I can vote for Virginia senators, you know, my local representative, member of the House, uh, and I can vote for the president. Uh, I can vote for, usually, it depends on the state, but you can vote for any, and usually you can also vote for the 
you know, the, the state representatives as well. So yeah, and we have, we have a campaign, we always encourage people to do that. And typically I find that overseas voters are probably, whoa, hold on, there we go, sorry. Um, overseas expatriates tend to be more inclined to vote. I think their voting percentage is probably higher than, than that in the, in the, in the main, main US. All right, thanks. Thanks. Kendall? Um, what were you interested in growing up specifically in high school? Um, I was a huge, I was a, I am a huge nerd. Uh, I, actually, I don't know, I, I, look, high school is crazy, right? High school, like, Kevin can tell you all about high school, but uh, I was also, like, I was on the swim team in high school. Um, I, uh, I don't know, I was a big nerd though. I, when I, wasn't, I didn't study too much, but I was always playing computer games and stuff. But I did, I'll tell you what, I, the courses that I was interested in, I did really well in. And that was all the humanities, all the histories. We had a class called World Heritage Study that was really cool. Government, you know, I, I was very active in the, the, the Mod Congress and Modern UN. Like I said, I was totally geek. And then my wife's actually over here listening and she's like, yeah, that hasn't changed. Um, <laughs> it's kind of follows it up a little more. But, so I don't know, I had a variety of interests. I played lacrosse, um, a little bit of soccer. So I, I tried to be athletic as well, but at the end of the day, you can be as athletic as you want, but you, I'm still a huge nerd, really. You know, video games, all that stuff. Yeah. Cool. I'm actually, this is how nerdy my line of work is. I'm actually one of the least nerdy people in it, which is very, <laughs> very strange. All right, Cooper, you've got a really strangely worded question. I'm you not, want I'm not you're not going to ask it? Okay, I don't really understand it anyway. What's that? Is that the question about puppy dogs? <laughs> no, we, we nixed that question. Okay. Sounds like he did. Kobe asked dog something dog. about, do you, are you dying to answer your puppy dog question? What was that, I, Kobe? No, All right, oh, no, we'll, we'll skip that one. Do you like puppies if so what kind? Do you like puppies if so what kind? And it's hard to have puppies in this line of work that you're always moving. And you're not even trying to ship a dog through here when it's 130 degrees out. It's not easy to do. So, yeah, we had dogs growing up, and, and I'm kind of glad I don't have any more. But, uh, not that I have anything against dogs. <laughs> I like these puppies, I guess, is the answer. Lots of flannel out there, by the way, guys. You guys are all got rocking flannel. You know, I just. Weird for me to see because, like I told Kevin, it was 117 degrees today. It's a flannel uh, day here in Monterey, definitely. Um, so, yeah, you said it's 100 and what there? 17. 117. 100 right now. That's insane. All right. So there was this question that Cooper was going to ask. Oh yeah. It got to be 145 one day. How can can you actually go outside in that temperature? Not for long. No. Unbearable. No. That's it was a Do you have a window that you can point the camera to? It's dark there, right? Yeah, it's nine o'clock at night, so it's yeah. just gonna be dark. Yeah, we're we're keeping them up late here. Oh, this one question that Cooper was gonna ask, it it has to do with um, the news. And I kind of want to rephrase it a little bit. How do you react emotionally to, to major news events? Do you feel like being a diplomat changes your, do you feel more like you react more objectively or more impassionately? Do you, does, does that change like, like the news when uh, Osama bin Laden was killed? Good question. Um, let me tell you on this with, with one thing I will say that I learned pretty quickly in this line of work is that the news is often wrong. That what you read in the newspaper is often wrong. And if anything, it's helped me be more skeptical about our media, which I think every citizen should be. Uh, this is my personal opinion. Uh, how does it affect you? You know, the more you're in this business, the more of a realist you become. I consider myself to be very idealistic and always have been, but the more you see, the more, I mean, the answer I gave, for example, about the, the role of women here in society is a classic realist answer. I mean, this is the way we see it. This is how it is. This is the reality. So you do tend to become more realist. And so news, you know, you, when you, we'll put the, the UBL, you know, assassination aside for a minute, because that is in its own category. But in general, when you read news, um, first of all, a lot of times when 
things happen and are following up on it, you know, or you hear about it, I might actually have met or know some of the people involved. For example, I know very well former, our former ambassador to Pakistan. She's a very high-ranking uh, diplomat and is still at the State Department. And she and I would talk about Pakistan all the time. And so I know her, and I, my former former boss of mine is very close friends with the president of Pakistan. I've never met the president of Pakistan, but um, you get all this time second hand, and you, and you know about these people and all this. Um, as a funny aside, when I was talking with the, this, again, this friend of mine, the former ambassador of Pakistan, we're, we're driving a taxi cab up to one of the Senate office buildings buildings to meet with Senator Feinstein, your senator, and uh, well, I was talking about Professor Sharp, the former president of Pakistan, and the taxi driver piped up and said, oh, I love that guy. It turns out he was from, you know, Raul Pindi or Islamabad or something like that. It's a funny story. Anyway, um, so you don't often know people that are involved with that or behind the scenes with that, and, you know, when you, cover, when you kind of have a topic on the whole world, this kind of, big news is always great. And so you do get kind of not jaded, but more realistic about it. You do often, you know, you also may have information that the media is misreporting or speculating about and speculating about incorrectly. So you kind of pop your eye and be like, well, that's that's not right. But you can't share that information with information classified or something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, take, try to take the news with a grain of salt. Um, but sometimes, you, you know, we are still here advocating in the American interest. So if you get a piece of news that you hear and it, you, it comes at least to the conclusion that you know the American interest has taken a step back, or something like that. You know, example maybe the, the assassination of Rafi Hariri in Lebanon a few years ago. You know, that, that's not you don't like that either. Um, you know, the UBL assassination was different. Uh, that's something you spent a whole lot of time about. But I will say that it was a very and it's. I want to be clear. It's not necessarily about the death of UBL, but more about what that represents in our longer term goals as far as. Conflict against Al Qaeda and and beating kind of pruning back violent jihadism and Islamo fascism or Islamic terrorism or any kind of you know aggressive terrorism, uh, but that news was greeted with extreme like I mean uh, it's hard to understate how thrilled people were yeah across government I, and and I mean look like I said I, I mentioned earlier there's probably a dozen a couple of dozen people in the last few years that have come through my office that have come through my waiting room. That have some kind of connection to terrorists that actually are trying to kill Americans. Hmm. And we've done our job to keep them out. And that's something we're aware of every day. The consequences of failure are very severe. And so when you get news like this, the really main driver behind this has been, been eliminated, for lack of a better term. You can't help but be happy about that. Not necessarily the death of a human being, because that's not very cattle, but, but what that represents in this kind of struggle. Um, and that there's less evil left in the world. I mean, Let's put it that way. So, and there's a lot of people I know, for example, we have an FBI agent that is a legal attaché here at the embassy who actually went into Afghanistan right not long after 9 11 and all was the hunt for bin Laden and all this. And I can tell you, he was thrilled. Yeah. You know, so, that, but that's its own category that kind of transcends all that. That will, I think, will be seen to be this generation's, you know, fall of the Cold War. Right. In my opinion. Really? Mateo, come here for a second. Mateo and I have a bet. Um, we. Oh, what? And uh, I, I said in class that this was the end of Al-Qaeda, effectively, that there's not going to be another Osama bin Laden in the landscape anytime soon. Matteo thinks that within a year there's going to be, he's going to be replaced with an equal figure. Or close to equal. Not close to equal. Close to equal. And we're going to have the rest of the class be the judges of who's right in a year. Who's going to win this bet? Yeah. As much as I hate to say it, Kevin, I think you are. Ah, yeah. I was, I was right, or was anyone bet except on this? No, no, no. Um, well, wait. Yeah. My view is the more optimistic view. Yes. Oh, you still... I was still... lose the bet and have to pay up, but this bet actually you probably will be right. Um, <laughs> again, if you were told me that you would bet on the Super Bowl, I was hoping you'd say I was right. Uh, but no, yeah, actually, to be fair, now... I'll say this, the, the, it's pretty clear that there are still Al-Qaeda cells operational, and they are still planning, and, and there are other terrorist organizations as well that are we are concerned about. But Osama bin Laden was a very unique figure. Uh, he was a big inspiration, and he built that inspirational presence up over a period of time. I mean, remember that he was involved in the 80s, with the uh, with Mujahideen in Afghanistan, so he has fighting the Russians. 
Yeah, against the Russians, that's right. So he's had all this time, and also financial resources, he's come from an extremely wealthy family. Um, you know, he had millions and millions of dollars to finance it. And so he's had all this time to develop this godhead, this cult, this, this, this kind of image of himself as this holy warrior fighting back, you know, crusader, as he called it, aggression and all that. And for him to be removed, and what, what we're learning is, and this is just, I'm, I, I don't have any, I'm not privy to any information more than I read in the paper, but what we're learning is that he actually still had a fair amount of operational control over the the day-to-day -day actions about data and their planning and, and stuff. So, you know, the, the reality is that, he, he, I mean, he's, he's a very talented figure that I just don't see being replaced. Someone, who, whoever replaces him, if they do, will uh, will not have that kind of weight and that gravitas and that kind of credibility in, in this circle. And there's a couple other things I want to point out. One is that, in spite of that, Al Qaeda is still fairly franchised. I mean, they're kind of the 21st century, 20th you know, globalized terrorists, but they're franchised. And they have a franchise in the in the Maghreb, North Africa. That's the Arab North Africa. They have a franchise in the Arabian Peninsula. They have a franchise in Iraq. And those are the big three franchises we talked about that are of concern. Um, and those guys still have the capability to act, without doubt. And there may still be another terrorist attack. But I don't know if that necessarily or conclusively means that Al Qaeda is back or anything like that. I mean, they still have a capability that they've been working on for some time, uh, and they still could execute it, even though you know, there's still some legacy projects in the pipeline, let's say. The other thing I would point out, and this is, I think, even more damning of Al Qaeda, and this goes back to my Facebook status, is that the real enemy of Al Qaeda, as it turns out, and the real effective thing, most effective thing that probably killed the Al Qaeda's image in the, in the Ummah, the greater Muslim population, is probably the Arab Spring. Is the fact that these people were demonstrating peacefully uh, for greater representation. Uh, these were the disaffected people that Al Qaeda proposed to speak for. Right. And it turns out that they weren't that interested in Al Qaeda. And there's a variety of reasons for that. One of them was the fact that they actually victimized more Muslims than they did anyone else. There are more Muslims died at the hands of Al Qaeda than any other than Americans ever did. Yeah. Right? Now, they were assassinating Muslim clergy in Iraq. Now, if you're a devout Muslim and you are disaffected and you are looking for someone, you're probably not going to look for someone who's assassinating your, your church leader. Right? right, right. And so, at the end of the day, Al Qaeda, you know, the, the slogans, and the slogans, and this is the, the interesting thing, and this is where I think our, our president's actually right on, it's not really about us. These slogans were all about democracy, were all about, you know, popular voice being heard, and they're actually very religiously inspired. You were in Iran, for example, this green revolt that was really suppressed by the regime there, a lot of the cries that, that resistance would use was Allahu Akbar, which is, which is Arabic for God is great. It's the beginning of the call to prayer. Every day, five times a day, there's there's four mosques within your, my house, and every morning you hear them, Allahu Akbar. That's the first thing they say. So very religiously inspired movements, but not fanatic ones, not terrorists. They were praying, they were praying for Allah to provide them with the means to rise up and have their voices heard. And it wasn't about death to Uncle Sam and the Great State, and it wasn't about you know Al Qaeda. It was about their own voice. And the best thing I think that we've done is let that happen and try to control it in such a way that the violence is minimized. And one last thing I kind of touched about this is that it's kind of tangential, but I think it's relevant. Is that if you look at the countries in the region that have had the most bloody revolts or suppression of revolts, they're Libya, Iran, and Damascus, and those are the precisely the three countries that we have very little in. But if you look at Tunisia, you look at Bahrain, you look at uh, with Egypt, these are countries all have some degree of influence, and the bloodshed has been much, much, much. It's, it's there, and it's tragic, but far less than in the other countries. Mm -hmm. So, in a roundabout, anyway, that's a long story again, I'm just long winded, I know, but that, I think, this is why I believe that, that Kevin is ultimately going to be right. But, yeah, you can't just kind of pop back, um, you know, next week, right? We hope not, and we're, we've done a lot, and we've gotten made America a lot safer through a lot of a wide variety of actions. You know, military and diplomatic, but no, we're, we're never on the same. Yep. A question? Yeah, come on down. Um, well, it has to do with your bet. Okay. Yeah, mainly, um. Have a seat first. I understand that Osama bin Laden is a very powerful figure, but in the last few years, he has definitely lost influence in Al in Al Qaeda. I mean, one of the last videos of him is talking about some French. Uh, hostages in North Africa. Um, and he doesn't. Oh, that's new. Oh, that's right. Oh. Are you there? I can still hear the audio is kind of the video is kind of uh, frozen, but I can still hear. So please go on. Um, 
it seems that he isn't really as strong as he used to be. So you have to think about during this. Well, bit. I've done it before. Yeah. Um, are you trying to look at he how? <laughs> are you well looking at this bet are you looking about how strong he used to be or how he is now or was yes. now what was in a short while ago um again I, I, I'll go back to what I, what I said to Kevin and Dave and ago. you know we're very aware that the, the possibility of attack remains like nobody's breathing easier but I think that when history is written we're going to look back at Actually, I think we'll look back at the the Arab Spring as what put the nail in the coffin, and this was just a sign of it. Um, this 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 last operation I actually killed him. I believe that you know, and it was getting harder and harder for him to communicate with the outside world for sure. I mean, this is when we believe he was living in a cave, and obviously it'd be hard then. But we still had him ended pretty well. He was still getting some information back and forth from his his you know his lieutenants in the field and all that, but. At the end of the day, I think we, we did a lot um, in the years after 9-11 to, to clamp down on a lot of things that made it a lot harder for terrorists to operate. People were, you know, we had globally operating in America and to get to America. And, and then we also took the fight to them out in, you know, in Afghanistan and, and obviously to some extent in Pakistan. Um, so I think, to answer your question, I think he, you know, he was still relevant, obviously, as long as he was around, he was going to be relevant. And always had that potential to do something you never know. I mean, right? We didn't see 9 11 coming. There's a bit, always a possibility there's another attack that comes. coming. There's this Christmas Eve bomber, this guy named Abu Mutala, who tried to blow up his butt crack right on that plane in Detroit. Um, you know, we didn't see him coming. We had indications, but those in the system at the time didn't exist to be able to stop him because he actually had received a visa prior to his radic radicalization. So how do you stop someone like that? They already have a U.S. visa, and you're not a radical. How do you stop them from becoming a radical? Well, that's a really tricky question. So there's always something like that. You know, it could be a, 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 a someone who comes from the United Kingdom and is radicalized there. And then, you know, British citizens don't need visas to go to the United States, so they can just walk right in. So there's all kinds of, of you know, devious plots that can come up with. But having said that, I think the ability for them to, to pull off these spectacular attacks like the embassy bombings, remember, that was the first... You know, the 98 MC bombings in Nairobi and Kenya and Tanzania were the first time you know, we really heard of Osama bin Laden. Then the USS Cole bombing in 2000, and then September 11th, and then the Madrid bombings, the, the, the London bombings. These kind of large scale massive attacks, it's going to be a lot harder for them to do. And if they do it, it's going to be a lot, a super hard for them to do it in the US. So, so yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. So, do you think future generations of Paris are going to be. Um, less scary in a way to um because they are not able to do as such a scary acts what, what, what am i trying to say well they won't be able to there won't be as much of a scary figure to the public yeah because they can't get away with such massive attacks well, they speak back. yeah that's a i mean who knows what the future holds you know, and again, there's always a possibility that someone could do something, but, you know, before, you got to think, before you guys were talking to you and remember, before 9-11, before the cold, before these things, terrorism was like hijacking an airplane, making demands, and then letting the airplane go, right? Or maybe, you know, the Libyans in 1989, I think it was, they bombed, they blew up a plane over Lockerbie, Scotland, with Pan Am 101. Right, and that was the thing they thought. There was none of this suicide bombing, these super massive things. And so, yeah, I think in the future, hopefully, you know, the best case scenario is, of course, there's no terrorism ever again, but realistically speaking, that might be more likely to happen than something like, you know, bringing the two largest top buildings in America, two, the second or third largest buildings in America down, you know, something like that. Um, let me ask a closing question. I'll let this, the class go, and then Matteo has a, a, a question that he wants to take his lunch, a little into his lunch period. Um, sure. First of all, thank you very much for taking an hour out of your evening and away from your family to uh, spend with us. I really appreciate that. Are they right there? What's that? Sure. They're right over there. Okay. Faces at me this whole time. We want to see them. Actually, they're around the corner. Obviously. Okay. Uh, no, uh, but but thank you so much. That's really really great. If if one of my students is interested in pursuing a career in the foreign service, what would you recommend that they do now? Okay, that's or, a very good question. First of all, 
like, it, let me say it's been a great pleasure for me. I've really enjoyed it and, and really like uh, you know the kind of Q&A. You guys have asked some fantastic questions and are so far much further ahead of where I was when I was your age that it's really impressive and actually gives you hope for the future, which sometimes <laughs> isn't a great supply. So thanks a lot for the great questions. Um, and of course, Kevin, it's great to talk to you again after all this time. Too. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, like I, I'd like to see that our airlines are kind of converging. Uh -huh. <laughs> But uh, when I knew Kevin, I had this big thing of hair, like kind of like Potato does. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I hope you went better than us. That's all I have to say. Good luck. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the things you can do. Uh, first of all, I think it's very important to join the Foreign Service after, like, it benefited me tremendously to have worked at Brush Ranch in the Academy in New Mexico, and then moved to Crescent Academy and gotten some kind of life experience under my belt after I got out of school. I thought that was really important. You know, have some responsibility. Actually, I mean, as a teacher, you know, you're, it's a big responsibility, and I actually draw on things I learned from those years all the time. So that was really cool. But it doesn't have to be teaching, but some kind of get out, you know, develop some sense of who you are, figure out who you are, and develop some maturity. Not too much, just a little bit. Um, and then, you know, and, and also, I mean, the thing about this line of work is that you, if you are inclined to and you're intellectual enough or you're curious enough, you can always learn. I mean, every day I'm learning something new. And so I would encourage that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of attitude as well that you get out. Like, when I first was going through this process, and it's a really competitive process, there's 30,000 applicants a year for about 200 jobs. It's really wow. competitive. And I think what, what got me through it is that I really was motivated to learn as much as I could about every kind of thing. I have a real broad you know, diverse range of knowledge from anything you would discuss, you know, culture, arts, sports, music, economics, political theory, current events, all kinds of stuff. So develop a real broad base of knowledge and to be able to have a conversation, you know, a real conversation, not just two people, you know, I'm talking and, and waiting for this person to shut up so that I can keep talking in, but an, an actual conversation. Um, my wife is now like, what? This is a conversation? Really? I said, anyway. Um, so, you know, it's important to have that, that kind of broad base of knowledge and have a little bit of understanding of who you are and how you're hardwired. And, you know, it's a hard process. And there's a lot of people who, who go into it and take them two or three or four tries to actually join and, and pass all the entrance exams and all that. That's very, very common. I was lucky I didn't, but that's more luck than anything else, I think. So that's what I would say. If you really want to do this, you've got to be motivated to really keep learning and keep your mind open and keep trying, even though you may fail the first time. Which I think is kind of a great life lesson anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's that's probably my, my advice right there. All right, Alex. Thank you very much. Everyone get out there. Thank you. All right, check your email uh, this afternoon for a homework assignment. All right? And then oh, come on, man. <laughs> Thank you. And Mateo, you got a follow up question? You got a question with a shirt on. I was gonna sit around my wife here. What? Oh yeah. <laughs> That was nice. We the collar is a nice touch. Thank you. Yes, Mateo. Um, okay. So kind of as a follow-up question to my first question. Yes, Osama bin Laden was impressive, if not a good guy, but he was an impressive figure. Charismatic. Yeah, charismatic. But he was very impressive and then he made an impression, sure. Yeah, yeah. But does he was I mean, yes, he was unique as an individual, but do you think but uh but since looking, if you looked at the Al Qaeda, um, I mean, don't you think that there could be another individual who maybe isn't the same type, doesn't have the same type of um, charisma as he does, or the same type of skills, but could be as effective in what he does? Well, let me tell you the first part of your question. Yeah, I mean, there will no doubt be a replacement for him at the head of the organization yeah. of some kind, right? Um, I think that's a fair, fair, you know, shot. And who knows how meritocratic they are? That person could well be, you know, a pretty capable person insofar as being an international terrorist go. But I really think that the big problem that Al Qaeda faces is this terrorist. Is that this is really what's going to cause them? You know, at the time they were the only voice for these people. That these kind of millions of people that were were kind of under the cosh, you know, were 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 you know, living being were very totalitarian. They were the only ones, you know, speaking for these people or who purported to claim to be speaking for these people. 
As it turned out, they were, they're, you know, all these people needed was a different voice. They've got a new voice, and it's a better voice. Yeah, it's right. You know, and now look, it's still early days, right? I mean, it's still, nothing is known for sure. Right. And, and, and there can always be backsliding and you need know, and all that. And, and you know, the, the progress they're making is not linear. It could be step forward, step back, two step forward, step back, three steps back, three steps forward. But, you know, that's probably just unwritten in the future. Um, but, you know, let's assume for a minute that this, this, these, these new governments form that are responsible have a role for, for the more marginalized and all that, have that and do hear and take account and are more responsive to their politics, their, their body politic, as we call it. Um, that's going to be, I think, the end of, of Al-Qaeda as a broad-based, kind of broad you know, organization. You know, and the other thing is this, if you saw it in the IRA as well, right? The IRA, towards the end, all that was left in the IRA are criminals, are guys that are, you know, Using funneling drug proceeds from the park, which is one big market area group down in Colombia, to finance the sale of weapons and, and, and the purchase of weapons and all that, and, and are not built republicanism as such. You know, they're, they're you know free Northern Ireland is I don't know just what they hang their they hang their hat on, right? But that's not their their criminals. And this is in the case of Al Qaeda, I would say it's the same thing. They're sociopaths who are wrapping themselves in this cloak of of kind of and Arab nationalism, or and, you know, speaking for the, the, the voice of the Ummah, which is the Muslim Islamic community. So, I, and that's where you get things like these imams in Iraq being killed. Like, no real Muslim wants to see an imam in Iraq, imam anywhere get killed. They venerate the holy people, right? So that just, but that's what these guys do because they're social fast, right? So I think at the end of the day, that's going to be the biggest thing that keeps up data from from uh, from becoming a the force that it was listening to you. Yeah. All right, Alex, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. So we'll, see, we'll see you uh, 24 hours from now, or 10 30. That's right. Cool. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. You too, man. Bye.